the feast of Our Lady of Walsingham links us to our brethren across the water. According to tradition, Our Lady directly claimed this part of England for herself. It was in 1061 that she appeared to a noblewoman called Ricardis de Faverche, and she was instructed to build an exact replica of the house of Our Lady at Nazareth, where the Archangel had appeared and requested permission to act. That's where our redemption started, and therefore to collocate that in the heart of Norfolk is in some way to claim the whole of that island for herself, Our Lady's dowry, as England is still referred to. And it is that same Mother of God who, in the 1200s, if I remember rightly, came back to that same land and again gave a special sign of her favour when she appeared to Simon Stock, St. Simon Stock, the Holy Carmelite, giving him the scapula and the accompanying promises, still important to us here in Ireland. And that part too, as it happens, is a centre of devotion to our Blessed Lady in that part of England, that is the southeast Kent, not far from where St. Augustine landed in 597, sent by Pope Gregory the previous year with another 40 Benedictine monks. You know how it happens, don't you? The Pope saw these fair-haired, blue-eyed slaves on sale in the marketplace in Rome and asked who were these and when told these were angles, replied spontaneously, not angles, but angels, and they must be evangelized. And so he sent this band of monks, which also collocates Britain not only in the Giron of St. Peter, but also in that of St. Benedict. For from the earliest times, the monastic root was there. Now, with regard to what our Blessed Lady was doing, she was shielding this land. In Wales, which had an early tradition already pre-existing that colonization by the saints from Rome, because, for instance, our area, the Cathedral of Bangor, dedicated to the early St. Daniel, has its, its date of consecration, not 597 or anything of the sort, but 525, indicating how much the Celtic Church was already in place. Now, Wales, like Ireland, was very Marian, and in the cathedral close to where I grew up, Clanloff Cathedral, which has an unbroken history of Christian prayer going back to Celtic times, now Anglican of course, but a very ancient cathedral, there is the Marian Chapel, the Chapel of Our Blessed Lady, which was not bombed during the war, whereas the cathedral was damaged and worship carried on there. And on the wall of that Marian Chapel, which is medieval, of the Anglican Cathedral, you have all the flowers in Wales which have Mary in their name, and there are very many. All these old Welsh names of flowers, and Mary is in the midst. And the only two carols still used in Wales with unbroken history going back to the Middle Ages are in the Welsh language I mean two Marian ones. Interesting. Mary is there, as we say, Dolen Gasult, a handle linking two civilizations. Now, Wales was keen on Mary, so was our Blessed Lady. And it's rather sad that it was a Welshman, Henry, who deprived not only Wales, but the whole of the British Isles of our Blessed Lady. Henry Tudor, became king, as we know, Henry VII, after the Battle of Bosworth. But then Henry VIII was keen on maintaining this Tudor succession, and we knew the lengths to which he went to make that happen. When the link, therefore, first of all, on a political level, was broken with a centre of unity, the floodgates were open. Remember that initially it was not <coughs> Henry's will, I mean Henry VIII, to create a new church. It was initially a political issue. 
But once that bond bound, that link was severed with St. Peter, then the ideas which were around on the continent could easily creep in. And that is exactly what happened. It's actually quite interesting what did happen, because you know the first wave, it was too early. He eventually did get the king that he wanted, but he was already dead at the age of 15 with tuberculosis, Edward, Edward VI. But then that had been too sudden and too violent, precisely because the instinct of the people was not yet ready. They were still Catholic at heart, and they did not like all this change happening so quickly. So when it came then to Mary, who was of course the legitimate queen, daughter of Catherine of Aragon, it became Catholic again, and Cardinal Pole reconciled solemnly England to Rome. What happened in that short reign? The sudden and unexpected death of Mary Tudor to this day is a mystery, a big mystery, rather too big perhaps. We don't know. But the result was that Elizabeth came on the throne. Now, we didn't know which way things would go at that point. It could have gone either way. She settled for a solution, a halfway house between Rome and Geneva, the famous Elizabethan settlement, which essentially is there to this day. Now, that point in time decided all history. What happened, actually, on one day, of that reign decided the whole of English spirituality to this day. It's what happened when it came to deciding who and what would be Archbishop of Canterbury. Successor therefore to St. Augustine who came, sent by Pope Gregory. It happened, it would seem, at five o'clock in the morning in Lambeth Palace. Some kind of ordination did take place. It was, now, say what you like, he had the orders in him. It was Bishop Barlow, who had a very elastic conscience, able to survive king and queen as the wind changed. Therefore, he adapted himself also to this situation. Oh yes, I'll ordain willingly. And so he laid hands on this gentleman, Matthew Parker, in this strange historic ceremony early in the morning in Lambeth Palace. What happened? Now, historians and theologians have been trying to unravel that ever since, and it was so important to unravel it properly, because remember that when Newman was around and the Oxford movement, it had not yet been unraveled. So we're quite happy now that we know exactly where we stand, because not long after that Oxford movement, we had the great crunch, because it could have gone either way, and it would have had historic consequences also for that now very Catholic sort of wing of the Anglican Communion. So Leo XIII got to the bottom of it, and got this commission of the highest experts. Did it, or did it not? Now, not happened, because it happened, but did it, or did it not pass? And quite a few thought that the Commission and the Pope was going to come up on the positive side. Yes, it did. But actually, no. It came out, and very strongly, and clearly, and irreformably, on the negative side. And the Latin was strong. Omnino iritum. It came through into English as utterly null and completely <coughs> void. <coughs> Why? Because of this. This little packet is something which has come down in our family. It has my great grandmother's tidy writing on it on the day that she was confirmed in Wales on the 11th of October 1882. M. E. Lloyd confirmed. Beautiful calligraphy. Now this is the Book of Common Prayer in English, and this, the other part of the packet, is the 
hymns still used to this day, the old golden oldies, which are actually used quite a lot in the Catholic Church as well, because their ancient hymns still valid. A lot of the ones that you know would be in there. But the commission had to go into the context. Now remember the context. It was not so much Henry now, but more Elizabeth and James, the first and the second, I think, or especially James the second, you see, that was a bit dodgy because he was sympathizing a bit towards the Catholic Church. But anyway, it was happening. Priests who were being hunted, tortured, pumped for information, and eventually hanged, drawn, and quartered, usually at the same spot, that where the last of all, our local saint Oliver Plunkett, was the last to suffer there on the famous Tyburn tree, a kind of triangle affair with room for eight gallows. But they didn't just die hanging, they died hanging and still alive. They were pulled down while still alive, brought back to life again, and then disemboweled. And the heart was pulled out, held out before the people in a ritual, still pumping away, and the executioner would say, Behold the heart of a traitor, and the people would reply, Long live the king. And then, after the heart eventually had gone out, there was much, much life there, so the head would be taken away, removed, and often put, I think, on London Bridge as a warning unto all. The head of our local saint somehow managed to find its way to Downside Abbey and eventually to Ireland and is down the road from us. Actually, it would seem miraculously preserved. It's not a skeleton. Look carefully at it next time you're there. It's actually a complete, complete head with seams some kind of skin. It's difficult. It's not in any way skeletal. And it shows majestically the suffering of a holy man in pain but keeping all his dignity of martyr. Archbishop of Armagh, head of this country, dying under torture for why? Because he was a priest of the church. Now that, therefore, was a crime. Now that, then, is the context. And the context is actually carefully analysed and given, given complete commentary by the very source. The 39 articles at the back of this give the Anglican position on everything. So it's their teaching. Now, when it comes to what is called here the communion, that is the communion service, therefore all the evidence is there, including what they've actually done. What did they do? They took the Serum rite, Serum is Latin for Salisbury, which was the old mass celebrated in England, right through, and if you look at it, it's actually essentially that what we have in Sorrento mass, it's not very different, but it's, the canon is the same. There, what have they done? They've taken the structure, essentially, and every time there is a reference to either the Real Presence or the Holy Sacrifice, as well as anything to the nature of our Blessed Lady and so on, out it comes. Not necessarily completely expunged, but actually put in such a way that it is a masterpiece of ambiguity and can be taken either way. But it's happening right through and with consistency in such a way that actually it's quite clear what's going on. Now, to crown it, you have two other things. You have the whole ceremony of ordination in there, <laughs> which is very important for the question under discussion. Now, the actual formula used is supposed to be scriptural, so they've taken off everything and left this in the early form of it, which is the one that counts for the transmission at this point. Receive the Holy Ghost. Now, even they themselves copped on about a century and a half later that it was not sufficient, so they added on for the office and ministry of bishop, priest, deacon. Therefore, themselves, saying it wasn't sufficient, but from within. A century and a half later, too late. The other is this. 
in the Book of Common Prayer, at the end of the rite of Holy Communion, as they call it, you've got this bit here. You can't see it where you are, but you can see what it is. It's quite clear. It is this paragraph. I will not quote it entirely, but I'll resume it in essentially one sentence. It says this. <clears> that <throat> the maintaining of the position of kneeling at Holy Communion is in view of maintaining order and decorum for such a noble act. But it is in no way to be interpreted as a sign of reverence or adoration for a presence which is not there. For what is received is none other than bread and wine. Now it's there in the equivalent. I am paraphrasing it, but it's there. And that wording is important because it's their own wording. Now do you see why when it came to the commission which gave this verdict to Leo XIII that there was nothing actually being trans transmitted, the question was not that of the physicity of it, because it happened physically, it was the question of the combination of matter and form, without which no sacrament functions. If you put water over a baby and do not say the correct formula, nothing happens. If, e.g., a priest in the past, when he was on his own, would celebrate the sacred mysteries and people would not know that he's making a blunder, if he were to go, as might happen, from what we call the memento of the living, that's the pause for the living, to the memento of the deceased, which is after the consecration, by distraction, it would be invalid. And that happened, I remember at least one time it happened, because the demon, I can't remember how it came up, I know it was actually a saint, a mystic. A priest had taken Holy Communion to a mystic, and the lady knew that it was not validly consecrated, and she said, why? The priest had a distraction and jumped from the mentor of the living to the mentor of the dead. So, you see what I'm getting at? There has to be completeness of matter and form. Now, when it came to ordination, what was missing? The whole intention was absent. The intention to do what the church meant to do was not there. So, we respect that intention. You can't then come back and say it happened nevertheless against the will of those who were doing it. It doesn't quite work like that. So, basically, in 1896, the Holy Father not only declared, but declared irreformably, because he was exercising his authority to say that all that came through in the so-called Anglican Communion was without the apostolic succession. It just did not pass. Hence, whereas Newman and company had to be ordained in some shape or form, they weren't quite sure whether it was absolute or conditional, anyone after that had to be ordained in Latin absolute, absolutely, that is, with no condition, because they are laymen. And we've had, actually, priests and bishops from the Anglican Communion coming over, and they've had to be not just ordained, but confirmed. A bishop having to be confirmed. Because that is the logical consequence. It's either there or it's not. And you can't, out of politeness, say, well, it's sort of there. No matter what they're wearing or not wearing, they might have all the garb in the world and gigantic mitres on their head. It doesn't change one iota. You're either a priest or you're not. Just to make it clear what's going on. <coughs> now, in the English situ situation, we've had in our time something very unexpected. We've had in our generation, in fact in these last years, an upsurge of desire coming from the Holy Spirit and passing into the hearts of important people in that situation to go back to their ancient roots and they're finding it very hard. You find that those who have any inst instinct of Catholic tradition are up against it in the Anglican Church right now. 
ordaining, first of all, women, and now consecrating women to the bishopric, to the bish to the episcopacy. They are bound to be aware that this cannot be in continuity with what we're receiving, so they're coming over. Now, in the initial stages, each one had to be handled individually, but now we have, through Benedict XVI, the situation of a whole structure handling them. What does one do with that? It's going to be difficult, because you're going to get, therefore, those coming from this, although in the future it should not happen, but there is the clause, which could be a loophole, that each, there could be special cases, of having these people who are actually married. Never a bishop, of course, but the question of the priests. That could cause tension. Now, what we want to take on board is this. When we are handling mysteries of that nature, we have no right to tread into another soul. What we can do is profit from it. Because what is actually coming in right now is a lesson unto us. We observe, as we see these people coming over, that it's actually extremely interesting. Because they come now in groups. Therefore a baggage. Therefore a culture. And one steps back and admires this culture. By now becoming fully Catholic. But what does one see? One. Dignity. Dignity which would make a lot of us really cringe out of shame. Dignity at the altar. Dignity in preparation. Dignity in preaching. Singing. Organ music the way the churches are kept well, dignity for God. Two, intellectual capacity and culture. The whole system of Anglican education is there, coming in. Three, the preparation and care given to preaching. I remember when I was still in school, I would willingly accidentally drift into an Anglican church for evensong sometimes, either the cathedral opposite where we lived or some other church where there was a good clergyman. Why? Because they knew how to preach. It's a pleasure to hear a good sermon. And even though the sacraments might not be valid, because they weren't sacraments anyway in evensong, vespers, it would just be prayer and praise, the sermon can lift a soul. So we must respect this. And therefore, know what the Holy Father was doing when he took this baggage on board. He was, in humility, recognizing the work of the Holy Spirit. These people must be used and not quashed. Fourthly, the whole question of the way in which the vocation is handed on, because with them is coming what we have in the East, vocations coming through families. My best friend was the son of an Anglican clergyman, the son of an Anglican clergyman, and so on. <coughs> the ethos coming through in where they grow up. They make very good clergymen because they're pure, and they've got the whole culture. Something that we can again stand back before and admire, but however, be careful, because the demon can use that to create confusion and to weaken our own heritage. <coughs> and that's what we're afraid of. I just finish. Why am I saying all this? I'm saying it, my friends, because we in Ireland, at least in the Republic, are not being challenged. We have only, usually, the local church. Therefore, we can get away with it. You go to a situation, e.g. America, Germany, England, even the north of Ireland, Scotland, and so on, where you have other standards very close to you, you think twice before giving short change. Now this short make us reflect. Why are we getting so few vocations, so few real fruits of prayer from our Sunday and Saturday evening assemblies? Well, I would say to you, God is not finding a favorable terrain in which to call. You can't do much in half an hour. You can't do much in five minutes of a homily. You can't do much in, basically, more of the same thing. You can do far more if you place young souls for some time 
in front of beauty, mystery, majesty, and otherness, and give them, yes, truth undiluted, which places them before their maker and their decisions, that is, the power they have over eternity for themselves and for others. Take away the electric shock from your sermons and what are you left with? More of the same thing. People coming into church and going out with more of what they knew. No growth, no challenging, no shock to the system. A feel-good system which keeps the collection coming in. Don't rock the boat. Well, I tell you, my friends, the Holy Spirit likes rocking the boats, so let's do something about it and not be ashamed of our glorious faith.